All right, well, this evening, <clears throat> contrary to the, um, what may have gone out in the bulletin information, if you had uh, looked at that, um, the text we're going to read is, is the Old Testament prophecy regarding the sufferings of Jesus from Isaiah 52 and, and 53. And we're going to look uh, specifically at Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12 this evening, because it shows us um, something of the eternal counsel of, of God, uh, what we call the covenant of grace, covenant of redemption, uh, the covenant that is, is intra-Trinitarian, which means that it's within the Godhead itself, their eternal plan and purpose to save us and what that uh, entails. Because Jesus, in saving us, essentially uh, comes to, um, to fulfill for us the conditions of this covenant in order to bring life to us. We call that, uh, he becomes our surety, he becomes our guarantor. Uh, we're going to use a modern analogy, he becomes our cosigner, so to speak to guarantee that the conditions will be met so that we will inherit eternal life if we have turned from our sins and trusted in Him. So let's begin by reading what it is that our Lord Jesus Christ did and then to see how uh, the Lord through Isaiah again shows us this was a part of the plan of God in order to, uh, in order to save us. So let's begin reading in, in chapter 52 verse 13 and we'll read through the end of chapter 53. Again, this should be fairly familiar to us. Isaiah writes, um, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and actually this is the Lord speaking in these opening verses, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Boy, again, as you read through this passage, you just think about all the New Testament fulfillment of, of these 
prophecies and how accurately it was predicted of what our Savior would do. But let's not forget this evening that what we want to see is what our Lord suffered for us, what he went through for us in order to reconcile us uh, to God. Now, as I've already mentioned this morning, we began looking at who our Redeemer actually is. We began by looking at more evidence for Jesus' deity, remembering that this area, this particular teaching is most under attack by cults, by Islam, by the liberals, and particularly by those that often show up at the door, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. We need to understand that this is a non-negotiable. We have to believe that Jesus is God in order to be saved. Not only because that is the only true Jesus, I mean the true Jesus of the Bible is God in human flesh, but because Jesus told us that we must in order to have salvation. He said to the Jews in Jerusalem, remember, who were the ones who particularly hated him, uh, he was always doing those things to challenge them and it kind of reached the point where all they could think of when they saw him was to do away with him. He said this in John 8:24. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You'll notice that the word he there is in italics, which means it's supplied by the translators, but it isn't really in the text. The phrase I am, as we saw this morning, is the equivalent of the covenant name of, of uh, the God of Israel, which is Yahweh. Now, they didn't understand at the beginning of the conversation what, exactly what he was saying, but they certainly did by the end of the conversation because we read in verses 58 and 59, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, in this case, it's not only the covenant name of, of God, but he's saying, I am the eternal one. Before Abraham was born, I have eternally existed and their reaction to this, therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And why did they pick up stones to stone him? It's because they thought he was guilty of blasphemy. We read in John 10, verses 32 to 33, again, in this case, Jesus giving the Good Shepherd discourse, saying, I and the Father are one. Again to the Jews in Jerusalem, he says this after they picked up stones to stone him again. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. The Jews understood what Jesus was claiming. And we need to understand that as well. Because that is who the Savior is. And we saw he must be in order to save us. Now, we are also reminded this morning that he is man. Uh, we have to remember that because there are those who deny the, the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Gnostic influence influenced the early church. There was a group called the Docetists who believed that uh, Jesus may have appeared as a man, but he only seemed to be a man because if he had truly been a man, he would be evil because all matter is evil. But again, I would remind you what John says in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3, that to believe that, to believe what they believe, is to do so to your own destruction. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. By the way, let me just again remind you, the spirit of Antichrist is the work of the devil, trying to undermine the work of God. And anybody who pushes or presses upon us ideas that are contrary to what the Bible teaches are not from God, not just in this area, but really in all areas. But again, the point is we must believe that he is fully man as well as fully God. And then we saw something of why he needed to be both. He had to be a man to represent us, 
to make the payment that we owed from our side. We owed the debt. He became a man to pay our debt. And he had to be God for several reasons. To be able to obey perfectly, to be worthy enough to pay our debt since our debt was infinite, to endure God's wrath on our behalf and survive because no mere man could have done that, and to receive the honor and the glory that would come to him for the work that he did. We cannot owe this glory and this praise to a creature, to a mere creature. We must owe it to God. So the one who saves us is God. Again, salvation is the work of the triune God from first to last. Now tonight we're going to expand on the work that Jesus did. Uh, God tells us in our passage to the prophet Isaiah that the work of redemption is really the outworking of an, an eternal agreement among the members of the Godhead. And it's not that they sat down at some point in eternity and decided to come up with this plan. This is an eternal plan, an eternal purpose in the mind of God, of which all three persons were in perfect agreement at all times. But we give this particular arrangement a name. We call it a covenant, and we call it the covenant of grace, and sometimes more specifically, the covenant of redemption, where the Father agrees that He will pay the price. He will give us His Son, the only one who can save us, that the Son agrees that He will come into the world and do what is necessary to earn the blessing of life for us, and the Spirit agrees to be sent into the world to apply the work of Jesus and to enable us to receive Jesus and the blessing that is in Him. So let's first of all consider this covenant of redemption, this eternal agreement between the members of the Godhead to bring about our salvation. Now we see something of this uh, in, in our text. Okay, let's, let's again just review Isaiah 53 in verses 10 through 12. And as I read this, listen to it carefully because we're going to make reference to a few of these points under the first point. Okay, now listen. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Now, we believe that this statement is really a reflection of that covenant or that agreement between the members of the Godhead to bring about our salvation. We see, first of all, here the Father's involvement in it, that He would send His Son into the world to be our guilt offering, to be the one who would bear our iniquities, to be the one who would be crushed in our place. I mean, think about if we had to bear our own sins, how those would crush and press us down into hell forever. Jesus takes that upon himself. He takes, well, Jesus, the Father sends the Son into the world to take his judgment against our sins and to go through the grief of alienation from him and to give up his life for us. Now, in order for the Son of God to do this, he had to provide the Son with the vehicle, as it were, the body, which to sacrifice and, and to do the various other things that he had to do, which we're going to look at under the second point, to do all that was necessary in order to guarantee the blessings of the covenant. But to do this, he had to send the Son into the world, and he had to provide him with the sacrifice that he would lay down, the one that we are reading about in this text. Now, we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, Listen to what he says here. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus, comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, that is the animal sacrifices, but a body you have prepared for me. 
In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Now again, God provided this human nature for Jesus through the virgin birth, as we saw this morning. But he provided him this body that he may do what was necessary to save us and that he might offer himself up. Remember, a high priest needs to have a sacrifice to give to the Lord to reconcile the parties he's standing in between. Jesus has a body, his own self, that he gives up in sacrifice to the Father. So the Father does not desire these other sacrifices, but he prepared a body for the Lord Jesus Christ that he might make this sacrifice. Now, as a reward for this sacrifice, he would give to Jesus those for whom he died. He would give us to him to be his offspring. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see his offspring. In this case, that would be us, everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, his brethren, along with the honor and the glory that would come from us for delivering us from our sins, all that would be given to the Lord. So this was the Father's plan to give his son for this purpose and to bestow upon him this reward, this honor for the sacrifice. Now the son on his part agreed to do this work, to offer himself up, to bear our sins, to provide us with the perfect righteousness that we needed so that we might be justified. Remember, justification is not just the forgiveness of sins, but it's also the crediting of a perfect record of obedience which our Lord Jesus Christ earns for us. That he might reconcile us to his Father and keep us reconciled by interceding for us. Now, the Spirit of God is not specifically mentioned in our text here, but we know that he is involved because he is the one who brings us to Jesus that we might receive this gift of life. And let's not forget what's said in other places of the Bible. Jesus says to the Jews in John 6, 44, no one can come to me. Nobody has the ability to come to me because nobody wants to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and the word there is, is quite powerful. It's not just a wooing, but it's a compelling. And that is done by the Spirit of God. And I will raise him up on the last day. So how is Jesus going to see his offspring? The Lord is going to send the Spirit of God to change hearts and to change minds and to bring them to the Lord Jesus. Okay, so that is the agreement that's made in this eternal covenant between the members of the Godhead. But now let's go a little bit deeper into Jesus' work and to see what, what he did for us here. Now, the best way to see Jesus' work for us uh, is to see it as our mediator and our surety uh, in this covenant, the one who stands between God and man to reconcile them and the one who does everything that is necessary to guarantee the blessings of this covenant. Now, the Westminster Assembly uh, put it this way in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 8, verse 3. And really, this, this is a summary, again, of everything that we're looking at, everything we saw this morning, everything that we're looking at this evening. This is what they write. The Lord Jesus Christ, in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all the fullness should dwell, to the end or to the purpose that being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished or equipped to execute the office of a mediator and surety, which office he took not unto himself, but was thereunto called by his Father, who put all power and judgment into his hand and gave him commandment to execute the same. Now, as I've said, a mediator is one who stands between two who have been alienated. Our sins alienated us from God. Uh, he stands between the, the alienated parties in order to reconcile them, in order to bring them back together. 
And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. He is the mediator of the new covenant. He is the one through whom we are reconciled to God. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Uh, Jesus, in his humanity, he became a man that he might stand between us and be the one who reconciles us. But, as you see from this text, in order to do this, he first of all had to become our surety. He had to become our guarantee that the Father could be reconciled to us without violating his justice, without violating his holiness. God can't just simply embrace fallen man unless that which stands between them is dealt with. Now that's what Jesus does when he becomes our surety. Now it's similar, we might say, you probably heard this analogy before, uh, to co-signing for a loan. If you go to a bank and you ask for a loan, that bank will typically, I, I think perhaps universally, won't loan you money for something like a car or a boat or anything that you might want to buy and borrow money for unless you either have collateral, which means something that they can tap into, something that they can uh, you know, get their, their money back if you should default on that loan, or a cosigner, somebody who is willing to take the responsibility on themselves to pay back your loan in case you should be unwilling or unable to do it. If you are unwilling or unable, they go after the cosigner. Now, in the case of salvation, we originally were under the obligation to obey God perfectly in Adam. And if Adam had made good on the covenant he was in, he would have gained life for every single one of us. All of us would be perfect. All of us would have lived forever. But Adam failed to make good on that obligation, and he brought us all into debt, which is why we come into the world the way we come. Indebted to God's justice, we're guilty, and under the sentence of death. Now, in the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace, Jesus becomes our surety. Jesus becomes our cosigner. He is the one who guarantees that the obligations of the covenant, that which needs to be done, will be done so that we will gain the blessing. He guarantees the obedience that we need to give to God. He makes the payment for the sins that we have committed so that we can gain, again, that blessing of the covenant which is eternal life, that which Adam failed to give us. The second Adam comes into the world and he accomplishes this. Now, as our surety, to do this, Jesus comes into the world as our substitute, okay, to do what he needs to do, but to do it vicariously, to do it on our behalf, okay? Now, we're all familiar, I think, with the title Vicar of Christ. If you're familiar with the Roman Catholic Church, you've heard that term because that's what the Roman Church calls their pope. And they call the pope the Vicar of Christ because they believe that the pope literally takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth as the head of the church. He stands in the place of Christ. Now, you've also heard the, the term vicarious atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he takes our sins on himself and suffers in our place on the cross. He suffers vicariously. Well, Jesus is our vicar, you might say, in the covenant of redemption. He takes our place in absolutely everything that he does, and he does what we should have done, that is what Adam should have done, to, in, to inherit or to, uh, excuse me, to merit or to inherit eternal life. Again, Paul writes in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. So what he does is he comes into this world as one of us, takes upon himself the obligation to obey for us, and he does 
obey so that we might be adopted, we might be reconciled to God. Now, we noted, this, um, we noted the same thing this morning, and we mentioned a few moments ago that Jesus received his body, and he took on our nature in the incarnation, in the virgin conception and birth. We read in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, that Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And in our nature, he lived the life that we should have lived, the life that we needed to live in order to enter into heaven from conception to the time that he died. He became our guarantee that the condition of perfect obedience would be met for us. And as our surety of this covenant, he also did something that Adam didn't have to do. Adam only owed a perfect obedience, and Jesus owed that, but he also had to take care of the sins that we had committed, the sin that Adam committed, the sin that was imputed to us, all the sins that we have committed in life. And so, as we've already read, he offered himself up as our great high priest. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, verse 10, by this will we have been sanctified, we have been washed, we have been cleansed from our guilt through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, uh, Jesus only had to lay down his life once, but once also we are cleansed by the sacrifice of Jesus, we are eternally clean. Now, we're going to see next week that doesn't mean that, you know, as, as some people portray it today, some Christians, well-meaning Christians, that if I am saved, that means I can sin all I want to and I'm going to go to heaven because if we are saved and if our sins have been taken away, we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts who has broken the power of sin and we will not want to continue to go down that direction. We will want to go the way that Jesus went. We will want to follow him. We'll want to be like him. So it's not a blanket statement saying that, yeah, I, you know, I can sin all I want and still make it to heaven but it is telling us that though we are imperfect and we will fail in many ways, we have been cleansed once and for all, and we will see heaven. So he offered himself up for us, and we know from what we saw not too long ago, the Father showed us that he received that payment of our Lord Jesus when he raised him from the dead. Remember, our sins put him in the grave. The wages of sin is death, but he paid for the, the, the penalty of that, and he was released from death. And his resurrection shows us that he has made payment in full for our sins. We know also our Lord Jesus Christ, after 40 days, after his resurrection, ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of his heavenly Father. And we know that he is currently ruling over all things for our good and for the good of his entire church. And we know that he is interceding for us as our high priest who can now sympathize with what it is we're going through because he went through absolutely everything that we have to endure, if not the specific thing that we're going through, something like it. So he knows how to come to our aid. And we also know that one day he is coming again to gather us together for the final judgment where he will have the honor because of his work of judging all mankind and where on that day he will acquit us of all guilt because of his sacrifice. And because, as you know, the sheep and goat judgment, because the evidence was there that we were doing his works. Remember, that's what separates the sheep and the goats, who it is that's obeying versus not obeying. They're not saved by their works. That's just the evidence that they have been saved by him. He will acquit us and receive us into the kingdom for the rest of time. Now, the only reason we're going to see heaven is because of what Jesus did. Everything that he did, he did for us if we are trusting in him this evening. If, uh, we know that we're trusting in him savingly if those evidences are there, the evidences that are in the sheep, that we are following his ways. He lived for us, as we've seen, so that he might give us a perfect righteousness. He died for us so that he might pay our debts to his Father's justice. He rose again for us so that we might be raised again from the grave. He purchased his Holy Spirit for us so that we might believe 
and receive his salvation. He ascended into heaven for us so that one day we might ascend into heaven. He rules for us that he might keep us and protect us from our enemies and work everything together for our good. He intercedes for us so that no sin that we ever commit will ever destroy us. And again, he ensures that we will repent of every single sin. And one day, he is coming back for us to acquit us and receive us into his eternal kingdom. This is what it means that Jesus is our surety and he is our mediator. Now again, the point is this, that Jesus, I should say that Jesus is God and man, is fundamental to the gospel. Okay, that's the only savior of mankind. That's the only redeemer there is. The only mediator is Jesus Christ who is God and man. And what Jesus did is fundamental to the gospel as well. If we are to be saved, we have to believe in a Jesus who has lived, died, rose again, and ascended into heaven and is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Now, these are the fundamentals, as I've said before. Now, we, we really have just one last one to look at, and that's what we're going to look at next week when we uh, look at how we receive what it is that Jesus has done. As you know, we receive the work of our Lord Jesus Christ through faith alone. Salvation is by the grace of God. We just saw what Jesus did. It's all his work from first to last. That's the grace. Not our works, but his works. But we receive that gift through faith that it may be by grace alone. But we also want to see next week that the faith that saves us, as I've emphasized several times this evening already, is a faith that transforms us. The Lord does not leave us the way he finds us. He works in us, sometimes very quickly, sometimes very slowly. But he is working in each one of us. As Jesus said, every branch that is in him will bear fruit. It will be the fruits of righteousness. We are saved by a faith that is not alone, but a faith that transforms our lives into the image of our Lord Jesus. Now, again, we have looked at a lot of things this evening. Hopefully some of these things will, I'm sure they all resonate with us, but uh, we're just trying to get an overview of these particulars. These are the things that are essential to a biblical gospel for, for our salvation and also the gospel that we will share with others that they might come to know Jesus uh, as well. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, help us to benefit from the things that we have seen.